All right, happy Sabbath once again. All right, so welcome back as we continue in this presentation of Daniel 11, uh, 24 to 35. By God's grace, I'll get to 35. But um, shall we reverently kneel um, in by God's presence once again? Amen. All right. So, how's everybody doing? Really? How's everybody doing? Good. Right? Are we understanding what is taking place in God's Word? All right. Are we interested in what is taking place in God's Word? This is what's important, right? That Because she says, when the books of Daniel and Revelation are rightly understood, there will be seen among us a great revival, right? Prophecy is designed to revive, right? And like everything else, before the great of anything, what do we first see? We, we, we see um, inklings of it, right? It, it, it builds up. In, so if we're not getting interested now, we don't expect to be fully interested when prophecy is fulfilled. Amen? And this is what, this is what we have to understand. So we must show interest in these things so that we can understand um, when it happens, right, then we can believe. That's what Christ says. I tell you these things so that when it comes to pass, you, can, you, you, can, you, shall, you might believe. Amen? All right. So, so far, we, we talked about um, the beginning of Rome, um, even for a time, right, when um, Octavius, who became um, Augustus Caesar, he took the throne, and from that moment on, the Battle of Actium, prophecy was set in motion. Amen? And they were to rule for a, for a time. But before that, we had one triumvirate, right, which led to the second triumvirate because the, um, in order to understand what's happening, we must understand the old. So that's why I went back a little bit. So we look at the first triumvirate, and it was the money man, the working man, the, finance, the, the manufacturing guy, and the army. Those were the three guys that formed this first triumvirate. The second triumvirate was raised up to avenge the death of Caesar, of Julius, right? So the second group that comes up in our time then, they were only avenging Car Carnegie, Morgan, and, and um, Rockefeller, right? Because the dragon is what? Wrath. He's wrath, right? This, this is all, every time you take down something of his, he gets angry, yeah. amen? And so um, we saw... Um, uh, we also read uh, a small passage that shows from Nimrod all the way down to these United States, showing how this, this, this pro progression is taking place from despot to republic to despot to republic and to once again. How many witnesses do we need? How many do we have already? Two, right? We don't need more than that to know what's coming, right? The first despot, Nimrod. The second despot, Papal Rome, right? We don't need more but the Lord has given us more. Amen? Amen. Because David says, Thy cup runneth over. All right? The Lord shows that you have no excuse. No one comes and says, I'm hungry, Lord. He says, No, I filled your cup and I made it overflow. Amen? Amen? All right. So let us look a little closer at this first triumvirate the money man, the working man, and the military man. Amen? Amen. So let us continue. It says, Caesar was the idol of the populace and had confidence of the what? Trade. Does Ellen White say something about trade union and the Sunday law? Yes. Then we must understand how the trade union work. Amen? Because they're at one part of the triumvirate. All right? It says, which after having been abolished uh, by the Senate were fully restored when in turn of the political will the populace held governmental Power. When the populace held, holds governmental power, what type of government is that? Democracy, right? Despotism. This is what they're trying to do with America, right? Mm -hmm. 
talking about this um, democratic republic. That is an oxymoron. Right? You cannot have a democratic republic. Amen? Continuing on. Crassus was the richest, the richest individual in the Roman world. And he represented the combinations of capital, the framer of what? The farmers. The tax. uh, sorry, the farmers of the ta taxes and the money class. Generally, who were not the nobility? The elites. Amen? Pompey, one of the mightiest leaders of her armies that Rome had yet known, was the idol of the soldiers, who, though not at the moment organizing legions with arms in their hands, were nevertheless a mighty political power, and if necessary, should demand, and if necessary, should demand, could be made in a day a mighty military power. These three men representing what? Labor, capital, and soldiery, covenant together. Did we read that already? No. Looks like the same quote, but all right. That no proceedings should be allowed to take place in the commonwealth without the consent of each of the three contracting parties. United, they constituted their power beyond all the resources of the commonwealth to cope with. Thus, the first triumvirate became an accomplished fact. And though there were a few expiring struggles, the power of the Roman Senate and also of the Roman people was at the moment what? So when, you, when the triumvirate comes, what, what goes away? The power of the people and what? And the government. This is what he's saying. Right? Your government loses power and the people loses power. Yes. They run the government. And they run the people. In fact, they, man, they were, they were destroying the people. It says, government of the people had been utterly wasted, and the government was now merged in three individuals with what? One controlling mind. Which mind is that? Satan. Satan. Right? It ha it's a battle of the great controversy. Amen? Um, it says, with one controlling mind among the three, and that mind... The mind of Julius. So Julius, I'm putting it to us, Julius represents, in some sense, the papacy. Right? Julius is the mastermind behind everything is whom at the end of the world. It's the papacy. Right? So every single one of these triumvirates, have a, they operate the same way. Nothing changes. Continuing on. It says, but the government did not long remain in this form. Crassus, in an expedition against the Par Parthians, was slain. And instead of the triumvirate being preserved by the selection of another in the place of Crassus, the two that remained separated, and the only question and the conquest was, a was as to which of these two should, be, should alone be the government. The Senate stood with Pompey. The populace supported Caesar. The army was divided, the most powerful part supporting Caesar. What followed? Civil war. Civil war followed, in which Caesar was everywhere successful. Pompey was defeated and slain, and Caesar stood alone as the head of the Roman wall, himself alone the government. Not only was the government of the people gone, not only was the government of the classes gone, not only was the government of a few gone, all government was gone, but government by one. And at that time, shall Michael stand up? Right? This is what, when, when we come to that point in, 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 in the world, that's when the Bible says, and at that time, right, Michael stands up. Go ahead, Michelle. Democracy leads to despotism. Because who voted for, for, for who, did, who did Julius have on his side? The populace, right? The people. He had the people. And the Senate is afraid of the people. Why? All power is really derived from the people, right? And if the people chooses a dictator, there is nothing the Senate can do. Okay? 
All right. So, present truth. American Sentinel. We, we read one portion of that, but I like the whole thing because, to me, it adds more. What, what I want us to also take from this is this is giving us a pattern, right? The pattern is always three, which leads to one. Amen? Are we following? All right. It was three geographical locations, but it ended up being what? The one, the world, right? Continue. It says, I know that in the busy world of today, close comparisons are somewhat out of date. And yet, it may not be inappropriate to recall to mind that 1900 years ago, three men, Roman citizens, divided the world among them. Anthony, Lepidus, and Octavius. Lepidus took the northern Africa and Spain. Anthony took Egypt uh, and the east. And Octavius took Italy and the rest of the world. But it was not many years before Octavius by what? How, did, how does Octavius come up? Octavius is the mastermind. The mastermind is the papacy. Everybody's following? How does the papacy come up? Force by force of arms. Right? And we're going to see that because the Bible says that. Amen? 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 Now, I do believe that we have been going over these in our homes. Right? So we're not oblivious to these Bible texts, right? In Daniel 11. Right? So what part am I talking about when the papacy uses force of arms? You don't need to know the verse. Just, ex you know, you don't need to know the number verse, but well, what am I talking about? An arm shall stand on its part. Right? You already see inklings of it when? Way back in the trauma rate. Right? All right. So it says here, by force of arms became Caesar Augustus and ruler of the world. This is the template. This is the pattern. This is how Rome operates. Amen? Because he was the first divine ruler of the world. Amen? Pointing to the last divine ruler of this world. Amen? Or at least the attempted divine ruler of this world. Amen? All right. And like Canard said, he went right back to the beginning. And how did Satan become ruler of this world? By doing what? Combining three things into one. He gave them all one thought. Right? He, the, the same thought the serpent had, he gave it to Eve. And Eve took that thought and gave it to... Now, one mind controlled that triumvirate. Amen? All right. So continuing on. It says, and then it was that the gates of the temple of Janus was closed, which signified under the Roman law and custom that war had ceased and that universal peace reigned throughout the empire. And then too, it was that the prince of what? Peace was born. Again, this is a very important piece of history. Because at the end of the world, when we see that time of peace, who's born? But how is Christ going to be born here at the end of the world? Man, great light. There's going to be some great light given to us at that time. The, had the Lord taught us about a little time of peace? Mm -hmm. No coincidence. In that time of peace, great light comes. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's follow. And so, as I look into the what? Future. Future. I again see the world divided in three. We read that quote already. But this time, it will be three nations and not three individuals who will divide the world among them. If not in actual territorial divisions, at least in dominating political influence. And now, these three nations will be, and now three nations will be, in fact, in fact, are named in reverse order of the ultimate political importance. Keep that in mind. First whom? Russia. First, Russia. Then whom? Keep reading. Great Britain. Then whom? Great Britain. Great Britain. Yep. T A I N. B R I T A I N, right? Yes. And lastly? Okay. 
No, it, he says political um, influence. And I want, in those, in those things, who had the more influence? Yeah. Right? As you go down, you see that um, Pompey had more influence than Crassus. Right? Whereas Julius had the most influence. Everybody's following? So I, that's why I wrote it this way. So it says, Second Great Britain and the colonies, a vast, magnificent, federated empire that will stand for unity and order. And third and last, the United States of America. And the last shall be what? Man, I, like, I love how these men use the scriptures. Right? The last shall be? The last one was going to be the most prominent one. Amen? Amen? All right. So let me ask a question. Not in order, but of these three, who fell off? No. Great Britain. When you come to 1989, well, who was the battle between? Yes, two were speaking lies at. Bro, it's the same history. You come to 1989, and the United States and Russia is now fighting for what? Ruler, rulership of what? Of the world. Who comes out on top? That's what it says, the most influence. Right? We see the spirit of the triumvirate playing out among the nations. We see the spirit of the triumvirate playing out among the businessmen. Right? We're going to see the spirit of the triumvirate in the church. Right? Because in the end, who comes out? The papacy. Amen? Because she says, the nominal Adventists and the Protestants, like whom? Judas. Judas does what? Betray us to whom? There's your three entities. Who comes out on top of that? The Bible says the eighth is of the seven, right? Ultimately, the papacy comes out on top of that. Amen? The one with the most influence. The last shall be? This is what the pioneer is saying. Right? Everyone's following. I, I really want us to follow. I don't want this quietness. Are we following? If I'm not making sense, let me know I'm not making sense. Let me restructure myself. Right? Or share with me why you think I'm not making sense so we could reason together. Amen? All right. I, I, want, I want us to understand. For me, this is, these things are very important. Because when you come to your house, do you have a triumvirate in the home? You have the children the wife, and the, and the husband, right? And if you don't order that based on God's government, in the house, who's going to end up on top? Almost always the woman. Who does the court lift up? The woman. Always the woman. She gets half of everything, and the children. And you pay child support for the rest of your life. And you pay alimony for the rest of your right? This is a principle. While it's prophecy, it's a principle that we see in our, in our everyday lives. Amen? Amen? All right. So let's continue. The pioneer looks in the future and he sees that. The, first, the last shall be? First. Who was last created? Eve. Amen? But the second Adam is going to be? First, right? So you could take that principle on all sides. All right. Continuing on, it says, As I seek to draw aside the veil still more and gaze still further down through the corridors of the centuries, I see again Augustus Caesar, Caesar Augustus, sole ruler of the world. But this time, it will not be a single individual, but the imperial democracies of the English-speaking race, ruling with directing mind and guiding with sympathetic what? Outstretched hand, a what? Christian world bound together by what? What is the iron kingdom? Okay. Bound together by the iron bands of justice and of? They're going to say they persecute you because you're breaking the law. Not because you're not following religion. The iron bands of what? Justice and? By peace he shall destroy? Same principles. Right? He's not changing. He's going to bring it in all sorts of garb, but the, 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 the student of prophecy have to discern it. Amen? All right. Next quote. The picture of imperial democracy ruling, as a Christian, ruling a Christian world is pleasing enough, 
but it is one that can never materialize. For imperialism is not what? Democracy. democracy, and democracy is not imperialism. The establishment of imperialism marks the end of what? Republicanism. It is impossible to separate imperialism from empire, and empire from emperor. The rule of the many over themselves is republicanism. The, this gone, there must follow the rule of a few, and eventually of one over many, and that rule was never anything else than despotism. All right? This we will see in our lifetime. Right? This we must understand. When Protestants shall do what? What does the last quote say? It says, when relit. He says, da, 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 da. ruling with directing minds and guiding with a sympathetic what? Outstretched hand, a what? A Christian world. Right? And Ellen White, she has she she been telling us that for a long time. When Protestantism shall do what? With the outstretched hand. Amen? To grasp hand with whom? With the iron bands of justice and order. Continue on. When she shall reach over the abyss and clasp hands with whom? Spiritualism, Spiritualism is the rest of the world. Right? And this, is, this, is, this is how you see it. You have Catholicism being the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Protestantism obviously being Protestants. And spiritualism is everyone who is not Catholic or Roman Catholic. Uh, 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 Protestant. Amen? So it says, when under this threefold what, Val? Under this what, Val? Dragon beast then? Right, right. Under this threefold union, our country shall repudiate some one principle. Every. Every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of people falsehood and delusion. Then we may know that the time has come for what? The marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. All right? Verse 28. All right? So all that was what? 23, 20, 27, and 26, I believe. All right? So in 27 and 26, you have this whole history of the two triumvirates. Everybody's following? This whole history, bringing the two triumvirates together. And also the Battle of Actium, right? This 300 and the beginning of this 360 year time period. Amen? Amen. All right. Now verse 28 of Daniel 11 says, Then shall he return into his land with what? Great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. That he here is um, Caesar Augustus, right? Because in 27 and 26, Rome is now sitting on the world. They've taken the south, they've taken the east, and they've taken the Pleasant land. Amen? And now they're sitting on the world. And now they're going back to their stronghold. Because where are they ruling from? From the stronghold. So in finishing that work, it goes back to the stronghold. And this is what this verse is bringing to view. Amen? And it says, from the strongholds is where they do this. It says, two returnings from foreign conquest is here brought to view. After the events narrated in verse 26 and 27, and the second, after this power, has had indignation against the Holy Covenant and had performed exploits. The first was filled with the return of Caesar after his expeditions against whom? Egypt and? All right. So that, that was one of the exploits. Amen? He returned to Rome with what? Abundant honors and riches, for says Pridor, at this time, such vast riches were brought to Rome from Egypt on the reducing of that country and the return of Octavius Caesar and his army from thence that the value of money fell what? One, One half. And the price of provisions and all vendable wares was what? So once Rome comes on the scene, what's the condition of the world? Inflation. Right? 
Inflation followed by recession, yes. Right? So there is something to be had about what we're experiencing today. Okay. This triumvirate, J.P. Morgan, Carnegie, and Rockefeller, they themselves brought on a recession in the United States. In is the early, either the late 1800s or the early 1900s. These men, by their activities, brought recession. Right? Here we see when this triumvirate, Lepidus, Octavius, and Anthony is finished, Octavius comes back as Augustus. All right, so I'm going to just put that here. And he brings back so much money that his economy crashed. So what is happening in our nation today, inflation, has something to do with what these businessmen, these men, are doing. Everyone's following. It's important that we understand what's happening in our nation for two reasons. One, so that we can know how to act, and two, so that we can know where our faith lies. Amen? Because once Octavius comes back, he's made Caesar, and this recession comes upon Rome, what was his next move? What is his title? Ah, no, the other title. The other title. Romario talked about, Romario went over it. A raise of why does he need to raise tax? Because the coffers of the, even though they brought back much riches, they need more because they're ruling from the stronghold, right? And so it has a direct relation. What I'm saying is what happens has a direct relation to bringing about Christ. Everyone's following? The raising of taxes is what caused Mary to have to go back to Bethlehem. Right? What's happening now in our government, these men who are ruling the, the finance is causing a recession, which is going to bring about what? Christ. The Lord has light for us. This is, this is what we want. The Lord has light for us. We just have to be patient because history says that recession brings what? Light. Was there a recession in 2008? Did we receive light from God? 2014. Look, I really do hope we can see it because it'll help us to plant our feet on this foundation. And no matter what's going on around us, we will understand. Everyone's following. Val, you were saying? Um, I wanted to understand better how that happened with um, how we brought up. I don't know. The thing is, one thing I do know is when everybody have money, who works? Who's buying? Everyone and no one, Everyone and no one right? It, it, riches do, like for instance, what did they do at the pandemic? What did our government do? They print money like crazy. And what, what happened? Because everybody had money. Too much money in the system is bad for the system. I don't, I don't totally ex know the ins and outs of the financial side of it. I just know by experience, because I live in this time, that too much money in the system is bad for the system. Right? Now, if anyone have a financial mind and wish to take that up, please take it up and share it with us. I just know too much money is bad for the system. And, and the world knows that. And that's why when Biden was printing so much money, especially the businessmen, because they lose. With too much money in the system, they end up losing, right? Yeah, and the value of money drops. The value of money drops but, so but not only that, yeah. people don't work no more. Yeah. They need people to work to keep them making money, mm -hmm. right? And then it becomes a, a they call it a, 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 a job seeker's market, where I get to choose what job I want because we are all rich, right? I, you can... You can I'm not struggling and I have to take the menial jobs. Man, that's what you're paying? I don't want that. I'm going to go over there. Because you know there's a million other jobs waiting on you. So too much money in the system has that effect. Right? Now, there must be a, a crossover into truth. Too much light might have a similar effect. Yeah, because but, Christ says, I have 
many things yet to, to tell say, you, say uh, but I can't give you now because you make it, wrong use of it. Exactly. It All right. Them. Amen. So where did we stop? Yes. Um, inflation. It says Caesar celebrated his victories in three days triumph, a triumph which Cleopatra herself would have graced as one of the royal captives had she not artfully caused herself to be bitten by the fatal asp. The next great enterprise of the Romans after the overflow of Egypt was the expedition against Judea and the capture and destruction of what? Of Jerusalem. So the pioneer is saying in this verse 27, the exploits is the conquer of Egypt and the conquering of Jerusalem. Right? What year was that? Jerusalem? 70 AD. That one. Octavius is now, um, yeah, it's talking about 70 AD. The Holy Covenant, doubtless, is the covenant which God made with his, maintained, has maintained with his people under different forms in different ages of the world. That is, with all his believers, the Jews rejected Christ, and according to the prophecy, that all who would not hear that prophet should be what? Cut off. This exploits, the Lord was using them to fulfill Matthew 24. Everybody's following? Everybody's following? Yes. What, what, what is Matthew 24 about? The destruction of? Jerusalem. Jerusalem right? And, it's, and the pioneer is saying one of the exploits of the Romans from the strongholds was the destruction of? Jerusalem. Jerusalem right? It says, should be cut off. They were destroyed out of their own land and scattered to every nation under heaven. And while Jews and Christians alike suffered under the oppressive hands of the Romans... It is doubtless in the reduction of Judea, especially, that the exploit mentioned in the text were exhibited. Next one. It says, Jerusalem fell in 70 AD. As an honor to himself, the Roman commander had determined to save the temple. But the Lord had said that there should not remain one stone upon another which should not be thrown down. A Roman soldier sees a brand of fire and climbing upon the shoulder of his comrades, thrust it into one of the windows of the beautiful structure. It was soon in the arms of the devouring ele element. The frantic efforts of the Jews to extinguish the flames were seconded by Titus himself, but all in vain. Seeing that the temple must perish, Titus rushed in and bore away what? The golden, the golden candlesticks and what? The and the table of showbread and the volume of the law wrapped in golden, golden tissue. The candlestick was afterwards deposited in Vespasian's temple to peace and copied on the triumphal arch of Titus where, mutilated, where its mutilated image may be seen. This picture right here, you can see the picture? Yes. All right, there is an arch. It's called the arch of um, Titus. Sorry, yes. Yes, the Arch of Titus, and it's right there, right? They etched that in stone because it was a great work for them. You follow? Mm -hmm. So you can see why the pioneer could say that was one of the exploits. That meant a lot to Rome, right? To conquer Jerusalem and take the what? The take the, can the, the, the vessels of the <laughs> temple back to Rome. Who did that? Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar right? <coughs> okay. So, I don't know what that means, but at the end of the world, this is going to happen. The, the, the things of Adventism is going to be taken to Rome. Right? All of Adventism is going to fall captive to Rome. Amen? All right. Let's continue onward. The next verse. So, these exploits is the taking of Rome and the taking of Egypt. Amen? All right. Continuing on, Daniel eleven twenty nine. At the time appointed, he shall return and come towards the south, but he shall not be as the former or as the latter. Now, I didn't highlight that earlier, but I hope we are paying attention. What was the time appointed? That's true. That's always true. 330 AD. No. Sorry. Yes, 330 AD. But... That's not what I meant. When did it begin? Yes. Because it says, at the end shall be the time 
but you, but it's the time appointed from where? From the Battle of Actium. This is the point I wanted to make. Sorry, Emily, you were right. I asked this question in a terrible way. So the time appointed is 330 AD, right? When Constantine moved the seat from Rome to Constantinople, okay? And, and, and it mentioned that earlier. So, but it says, he shall return and come towards the south, but not as, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. latter. I have this twice, yeah? Okay. Why? I don't know. <clears throat> All right. The time appointed is probably the prophetic time of verse what? 24. Which had been previously mentioned, it closed as already shown in AD 330, at which time this power was to return and come again towards the what? But not as the former occasion when it went where? Into Egypt or as the latter occasion when it went where? Into Judea, right? So it, 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 it did something, but it wasn't as glorious as when it conquered Egypt or as when it conquered Jerusalem, right? And it says, those were expeditions which resulted in conquest and glory. This one led to what? Demoralization and ruin. The removal of the seat of the empire of Constantinople was the what? This is nice, right? Because when, I don't know how soon, but there's, a, there's some studies that shows the signal, right, what it means. There, there is that, and then there is another signal that, she, that Ellen White points out. She says, when, um, she says the, 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 the sudden leaving of Cestius was a what? Was a signal for the Jews to do what? Flee. To flee. So there are some specific signals that Adventism has to understand. This is one of them. Everybody's following? When the seat moved from Rome to Constantinople, that's a signal that we must understand. Right? <coughs> Go ahead, Quinton. Isn't that part of um, Revelation 18? Talking about Babylon's fall and us moving from up. Yes, it, 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 it's connected. Amen. Come out of my people, yes. Now, uh, may, I don't know if Kanar is going to touch on these things, but when you go to Daniel 1140, it says, He shall plant his tabernacles between the seas and the... Okay, if he's planting it there, where was it before? Not there. Not there. So what is he doing? He's moving his seat. Right? So we must understand the movements of... the sea Because it's a signal. Right? It's a signal of what? The fall. Right? Because it says, He shall come to his end and... None shall help him. Amen? Yeah. All right. It says, the robbers of our people shall exalt themselves, but they shall fall. fall. Amen? Amen. Without hands. So, continuing on. It says, Rome then lost its prestige. The Western division was exposed to the incursions of foreign enemies. On the death of Constantine, the Roman Empire was divided in how many parts? Three, Three parts. Why would the Lord allow that? Reason. Why would the Lord allow that? What's the principle? That's true. The principle is three. Right? How many parts did they conquer to become uh, a, a world power? So when they fall, how many would they be divided into? Why? Because the next power has to take what? All three of those all three of those locations. Yes. Right? Everybody's following? All right. Let's keep reading. It says, On the death of Constantine, the Roman Empire was divided into three parts between his three sons, Constance, Constance II, Constantine II, and Const Constantius, Constantine II, and Constance. Constantine II and Constance quarreled, and Constance became what? Okay, so we started as three, right? And how much did it end with? One. No, 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 no. Right here. Now it has what? Is that not how the triumvirate works? The same principle. Nothing is changing. Amen? 
And now, instead of you have three parts of Rome, you have Eastern Rome and Western Rome, right? And Constantine moved from the West to the East, leaving the West open for another power. Everybody's following? Yeah, he moved from West to East, right? And so, but before there was West and East, there was three. Those little details to me is important, right? Because it's operating on the same principle. So it says, He was soon slain by one of his commanders, who in turn was shortly defeated by the surviving emperor, and in despair he ended his own days, A.D. 353. The barbarians of the north now began their what? Their incursions and extended their conquests till the imperial power of the west expired in what? AD 476, right? So in 476, the west was taken over by barbarians. Amen? This was indeed different from the, former, from the two former movements which brought to view in prophecy. And to this, the fatal step of removing the seat of the empire from Rome to Constantinople directly led. Amen? So now they're no longer ruling from where? From the stronghold. Everybody's following? When they were ruling from the stronghold, they were able to conquer. They were able to do exploits. Now you come to 330 AD, it shall not be as the former or the latter. They're now they're weak. And now the barbarians coming in and they can no longer, well, they, they no longer have the stronghold. Amen? Because they move from west to East. Everybody's following this, this series of movements. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, we can see that in the beginning of our history, too, because um, God gave Adam dominion over everything. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess he had a stronghold of sorts. Eden, Eden was a stronghold. To God. But then when that was moved, God moved his seat to the out of Eden as well, out of the garden. And now he no longer has that same dominion. Who no, who, God no longer has the same dominion? I'm I'm talking about Adam. Okay, say it again. Okay, sorry. Um, so in the beginning, Adam was given dominion over all the earth, mm -hmm. and he was inside of the, in the garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. And also, he had a stronghold in being obedient to God. But once he moved that and he started to, he chose disobedience, he moved his seat spiritually. Yeah. So God moved his seat physically and sent him out of the garden. And now he no longer has that dominion over all the earth like he once had. Okay, amen. Amen. Adam moved the seat from Rome to Con Why am I saying Rome to Constantinople? What is Rome a symbol for? Why? How can you prove that? That how else can you prove? Because Christ Christ came in at right? If you wanted Christ, where did you have to go? To the Roman Empire. Right? So praise God, yes. He moved from Rome to Con Quinton, that's a nice stuff. So, continuing on. So, once he moves, here comes the barbarians. Amen? All right. So, let's just look at them a little bit. Verse 30. Now, we need to be paying attention from verse 29 onwards, if we wasn't paying attention before. Right? But I believe we were paying attention before. So, let's pay more attention to these verses. Amen? This moving of the seat is important. Amen? It, because Rome is now transitioning. Everyone's following? All right. So now we come to verse 30, and it's telling us how the, what the barbarians did. It says, For the ships of Chittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return, and having the nation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that what? Forsake the holy covenant. This is from your um, Daniel Revelation. Was there ever a naval warfare with Carthage as a base of operations waged against the Roman Empire? We have but to think of the terrible onslaught of the Vandals upon Rome under the fierce Genseric to answer readily in the affirmative. Sallying, from every spring, sallying every spring from the port of Carthage at the head of his numerous and well-disciplined naval forces, he spread consternation through all the maritime provinces of the empire. That this, is his, that this is the work brought to view is further evident when we consider that we are brought down in prophecy to this time. In verse 29, 
the transfer of the empire from Rome to Constantinople we understand to be mentioned. Following in due course, as the next terrible revolution, came the in eruptions of the barbarians from the north, prominent among which was the Vandal War already mentioned. The years AD 428 to 468 marked the career of Genseri. So here, after 330, the cities move. Here comes the barbarians. B-A-R-B-A, -A, right? First of which you asked me to say is the Vandals. Amen? On to the next um, quote. This is William Miller. He says, The angel therefore says in the next verse, C30, verse 30, For the ships of Chittim shall come against him. Mean, the meaning of which is that whom? The Huns, which live on the north of the Adriatic Sea, the place where it was anciently called what? Chittim, under their leader, Attila should ravage the Roman Empire. So Miller says it's the, the Huns. Go on to the next quote. I don't remember who wrote this one, but it's not, it, I think it's Lich. If I'm not mistaken, but you could check it out. It says, the ships of Chittim shall come against him. The hordes of what? Northern barbarians shall invade his dominion and conquer the portion which he vacated by removing to so I think this is Lich, but who does he say? He just says the barbarians. Which one of them is correct? All of them. Why? What does Miller Rule say? If it makes good what? Sense, right? Then you know you have the, the truth. Does it make sense that the Huns came against Rome? Yes, you could simply read that in history. Does it make sense that the Vandals came? Which means then, each one of them did a work that we must understand. Right? A specific work that we, we're going to see at the end of the world. Amen? Because the barbarian host is representing this body of work that is to be done in the time when the seat is moved from Rome to Constantinople. Amen? Nebuchadnezzar? Tyre. I want to quickly pick your uh, interest with something, right? Um, and I want us to see. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's go to Numbers 20, 24 and verse 24. I just want to pick our interest real quick. Now, I don't understand this verse totally yet, how to play it, but I just want to, I'm going to just put it there. Maybe one of you will bring the answer back. Amen when it is found. Numbers 24 and verse 24. This is Balaam's prophecy about the end of the world, right? And I say that because each of the ancient prophets spoke less for their own time and more for our time. our time. Amen? So this is Balaam's prophecy. And Balaam says in verse 24, And the ships shall come from the coast of what? And the what? Afflict whom? Asher. Who is Asher? Assyria, Babylon, Rome, right? Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing with the barbarian hordes is only teaching us what's going to happen in Balaam's prophecy. Everyone understanding? Because Balaam's prophecy is really about Revelation 18. Right? Balaam's prophecy is about Daniel 1140 to 45. Right? So when you go into the... And I, I, I don't totally understand it yet, but I know the Lord has connected what Balaam just said with what we just read about the ships of Kittim coming against him. Everyone's following? I just wanted to put it on the record just so that... Maybe you might be reading something and some flash across your mind and it'll peak. Uh, it'll, it'll, a thought will, will, will come to connect these two. But the Lord, the, Lord, the Lord connects them. Balaam says the ships of Kittim and Daniel says the ships of Kittim. Both of them, right? Balaam says Asher. 
But Asher is only a symbol for Babylon. Babylon at the end of the world. Right? So, let us continue. It says, He shall have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Indignation against the Holy Covenant, that is the Holy Scriptures, the Book of the Covenant. A revolution of this nature was accomplished in Rome. The Heruli, Goths, and Vandals who conquered Rome embraced the Arian faith and became enemies of the Catholic Church. It was especially for the purpose of exterminating heresy that Justinian decreed the Pope to be the head of the Church and the corrector of heretics. The Bible soon came to be regarded as what? As a dangerous book that should not be read by whom? By the common people. But all questions in dispute were to be submitted to the Pope. Thus, the indig indignity heaped upon God's word. And the emperors of Rome, the eastern division of which still continued, had intelligence or connived with the Church of Rome, which had forsaken the Holy Covenant and constituted the great apostasy for the purpose of putting down heresy. What, what, what did he say is the great apostasy? When the West, when the East have intelligence with whom? He calls it the great apostasy. Right? So when we see someone at the end of the world having intelligence with the papacy, what, what are they beginning? The great what? And national apostasy is followed by what? All right. This is not the fulfillment of the prophecy, but we have to see its uh, principles. Amen? Right. Once, man, that's nice. 9-11. All right. 9-11 typified national ruin. And I also understand that because it was a national event. Right? Everybody in America knew where they were on 9-11. Except children. Those little ones. So it says, the man of sin was raised to his presumptuous throne by the defeat of the Aryan Goths who then held possession of Rome. Now in some sense, since 1989, there is a few sects that is keeping the papacy from gaining the throne. Right? They're typified by those three horns that kept the papacy from going, gaining the, the throne. Amen? Say again? Oh, okay. Yes. So, again, we have to be able to distinguish prophecy from. It's really important. Because while it will have all the tenets of prophecy, it is not the fulfillment of prophecy. It'll just be that principle playing out itself in certain activities. Amen? Amen? All right, because in 1989, our country had intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Amen? National apostasy is followed by national ruin. Let us continue. What are those things on the page? Ah, those are the military insignias, right? So the next verse says, and what? Arm shall stand on his part, and they shall what? Pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination and make it. So it says, after the barbarians, all this happens. They have intelligence. And the next thing it says is arms. Arms with an S. Arms, plural. Amen? Amen? All right. The word arms means what? Power. The, the bold part. The arm as what? Stretched out. What did America do? Stretch their hand across the gulf. Is that what it says? So to stretch your hand across the gulf is to give your arms to the, to the papacy. Amen? All right. So it says, arms are stretched out or force or what? Power. And when we go to Revelation 12, it says what? She shall cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, to receive the mark, the mark right? Because that's the arm standing on the part of the, of the papacy. Amen? All right. Let's see what the Bible tells us is arms. It says, now when a copy of the king's 
of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Shimshai the scribe and their companions, they went up in haste where? Where's Jerusalem? What is Jerusalem a symbol for at the end of the world? These United States, right? Unto the Jews and made them to do what? By what? Force and? So where was that force? Come, where did the force come from according to the text? From the letter of the king's commandment. Right? So when arms stand on his part, it's not only just the army, but what else? Laws. The force of American laws is now turned to uphold what? Papal doctrines. What year do we mark that? We mark it in this movement. What year? When our laws turned to papal enforcement. 9-11. We went from English law to Roman law. Right? So the military was given in 1989, but the laws were given over when? 9-11. Inseparably linked. Amen? All right. Let us continue. It says, they shall pollute the sanctuary strength and take away the daily. Amen? All right. How was the daily of paganism taken away? As this is spoken of in connection with the placing or setting up of the abomination of desolate or the papacy, it must denote not merely the nominal change of the religion of the empire from paganism to Christianity, as on the conversion so-called of Constantine, but such an eradication of paganism in all, from all the elements of the empire, that the way at, the way would be open would the way would be all open for the papal abomination to arise and assert its arrogant claims. Such a revolution as this, plainly defined, was accomplished, but not for nearly two hundred years after the death of Constantine. As we approach the year five hundred eight we behold a grand crisis ripening between Catholicism and the pagan influences still existing in the empire. Up to the time of the conversion of Clovis, king of France, AD 496, the French and other nations of the Western Rome were pagan. But subsequently to that event, the efforts to convert idolaters to Romanism were crowned with great success. The conversion of Clovis is said to have been the occasion of bestowing upon the French monarch the titles of the most Christian majesty and eldest son of the church. Between that time, 496, and AD, 4, and AD 508, by what? Alliances, by what? Capitulations, and by what? Conquests. Keep those, those things we must understand, because that's how they're going to do it at the end of the world. By alliances, capitulations, and conquests. Right? This is how the barbarian hordes are taken away. Everybody's following? What is a barbarian? Not necessarily. Rome or pagan. But they call people barbarians. What is a barbarian? One who is lawless. Uh, um, uncivilized. That's the word. They, no, no, no. Rome was pagan. Yeah, I get it. But but Rome was calling everyone else. In fact, that stemmed from the Greeks. The Greeks was the first group that used the word barbarian. Because they, you know the Greeks, they were exalted in themselves. They loved the human body. Right? They, and, and, you know, they, they exalted in wisdom. So anyone who didn't have that kind of wisdom was uncivilized. That was their, so they call them barbarians. All right? So the point is that Somewhere in our history, we would have to identify this barbarianism, right? Which leads to the point where it's taken away, and now arms can be given to the... Everybody's following what I'm saying? And the arms is now given to the papacy, right? So if in 508, arms were given to the papacy... Sorry, in 1989, arms were given to the papacy, where should we have seen those barbarian hordes? No, no, no. If in 1989 arms were given to the papacy, where should we have seen those barbarian hordes? Before 1989. Amen? We don't understand it totally, but the point is 
the barbarians is what leads to 508. Yes. Amen? Amen? It leads to them having intelligence with those that forsake the holy covenant. The whole point of having that intelligence was to remove the Aryan faith. Yeah. Right? So it means there was some battle that we just don't know about, which is why Reagan reached out to the, to the papacy. Yeah. Amen? All right. Part of it is... Um, Atheism, right? Atheistic communism, right? But we know at the end of the world, it's not just that. It's businesses, right? It's education. All of those things have their barbarian uh, aspect. Everyone's following? Because all things must come under the power of Rome, amen? Not just religion, right? They must also rule the economy. They must also rule manufacturing. They must also rule... All of those things have the element of barbarianism. You follow? Right? And for instance, what is Black Lives Matter? Right? So you, you, there is principle and there is prophecy. Right? And I want to see that that principle never ceases to, to pervade itself in our society. Thank you, Sasha. Go ahead, Kunar. Yep. Uncivilized. uncivilized. When you look up uncivilized, unci it means a person who doesn't lead a regular life. They're, they're unnatural people. <laughs> so I could, that's why I could see why the Democrats are barbarians, because they have unnatural policies. They don't, they don't follow regular life, and that's what they want. But what does that say about you when Christ seen you the hope of glory? You wouldn't be leading a regular life according to their... Yeah, you, um, you will become the trumpet. Everyone's following? Mm -hmm. And they'll be doing everything in their power to exterminate you from their kingdom. Go ahead, Bob. Um, when Mark was saying about barbarian, it brought my mind to when, well, I guess in Christ's time, you could say that is a type of being, um, what they call Christ unknown. Yeah, a barbarian. Like I say, it comes from Greek. What, what was the Greeks? The Greeks seek after what? So they are learned. And they called everybody else who wasn't Greek barbarian, right? Unlearned. Yeah. Savages. They call you savages or whatever those words they use, right? Wild. Doesn't matter. All right? But there is a wild man they can't tame. Just so you know. Yes. Amen. The last quote. It says, from the time when these successes were fully accomplished, namely 508, the papacy was triumphant so far as paganism was concerned. For though the latter doubtless retarded the progress of the Catholic faith, yet it had not power, if it had the disposition to suppress the faith and hinder the encroachment of the Roman pontiff. When the prominent powers of Europe gave up their attachments to paganism, it is only to appropriate to it its abominations in what? In another form. For Christianity, as exhibited in the Catholic Church, was and is only paganism baptized. Right? So the taking away of the daily is not the removing of the daily altogether, but it's the covering it with the garb of Christianity. In essence, exalting it into a new realm of, uh, a new form of worship. Amen? All right. So... All right, I'll just get this last part in here. Um, my time is almost uh, already finished, but I want to make this point. Um, it says arms, plural, shall stand on this part, right? And the first arms we read about was Clovis, amen? All the, all the pagan nations who converted to Catholicism, Catholicism they became the armies of the, of the papacy. When you get to 508, there is still three pagan nations resisting Catholicism, mm -hmm. right? There you go, that number three again, right? You know, for the, papers, the Pope to be on top, it must unite Rome as one, because Rome was divided into three, right? But it must also bring the pagans as one, right? But there's three 
that's keeping him, so those three has to go. Everyone following? And another thing that was nice, I was watching Jeff and he was saying, there's another part of Rome that the papacy also had to deal with. The Senate, the judiciary, the, the three government system had to go. You can't have that system if you have a one-man power. Right? So it's just always this removing of the three things for the establishment of the at the end of the world, what is Satan trying to remove? The Father, Son, and? To plant what? Just, Just that one. All right? It's the spirit of the dragon. Amen? All right. So this next um, section, please read it. I think it's important. Ah, should I? Yeah, no. I will, I, I, I will, but yeah, I'll stop here. I'm not going to. Just keep in mind, we're going to stop here on this. This, this. There's a second set of arms that we're going to talk about, right? Remember, arms is force and power. and power, but the Bible in Esther says this force and power comes from what? From decrees, right? There was no decrees from the barbarians. You follow? So then there's another part. In order for the papacy to come to power, there's a decree that must be made. Right? A decree must go forward before she could rise to the top. So we'll pause here. I encourage everybody to read it. Um, yeah, hold on. I encourage everyone to read. I didn't, I try as much as possible to take like the most important, what I thought was the most important pieces of your Smith and these pioneers. But if you go back and read it, there's a wealth more of information because I just took, you know, portions and put them in here just so we could get a gist of this great history. Everyone's following? Yeah. Go ahead, Em. When Trump moved the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and acknowledged Jerusalem as the capital, mm. is that related to Constantine the, the siege from Rome to Constantinople? Uh, when you say related, explain related. You're saying if that is fulfilling that? I know, I'm just trying to get her to bring it out. Now, the principle is, is there, right? Because pro the Protestants do have a teaching that Jerusalem is going to be, you know, exalted. Yeah, it will be rebuilt and all that. So, so, so Satan would allow these things in order to keep them deceived. But he can't get that principle from nowhere else, right? But what God has set forth. So, so you could see... In him doing that, he's just taking something that God set up for good and trying to make it evil, yes. right? So it's not a fulfillment of those words per se. I mean, many a nations have moved their capitals, right? And this is only giving us a thought that nations can move capitals. Yeah, they used to be in New York. In fact, they was in Philadelphia one time, and then they moved to D.C., right? So, but it's moving from the stronghold is what you need to understand. Not just moving, it's moving from the stronghold, right? What's the stronghold of this nation? Now you have to find out what is the stronghold of this nation. Yeah. Now, does it matter that, um, you know, Tel Aviv was a stronghold of, I don't know, does that play in prophecy? I don't think so, no, right? Because the prophecy is about whom at the end of the world? Yeah. These United States, right? So Satan is trying to get us to watch this hand while he does something else on the other hand. But we have to also watch the hand of God, the hand that's beneath the wheel. Amen? That's the hand we watch that, that, that uh, controls the play and counterplay of human events. Amen? All right, we'll close here, and we'll pick it up uh, next week from this page. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for uh, this blessed day and for the time that we're able to spend here in your word, going over these old things, Lord, and seeing uh, it's glory in the applications of the new lord for it is it is the light of the new that glorifies the old that we are told and so lord we pray that as we uh as we all partake as we eat from 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 your table that we may all be filled we may be satisfied but lord that we may be um moved to always come back to this place lord to get to get our, our food your table we, we thank you uh, for opening up our, our understanding on these things. I pray that each one of us here may go forward, Lord, with a zeal in wanting to know more, 
wanting to understand how these things affect them here at the end of the world. Please forgive us for our sins, and please, Lord, may the Holy Spirit stay with us throughout the Sabbath, teaching us and admonishing us how to keep your Sabbath holy. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.